So I see a few new faces. Uh, I'm James. I work here at Gaslight. Um, and uh, why don't we go around, do introductions, and then we'll talk about what we did last month and what we're going to do this month. So maybe go around, say who you are, and uh, if what you've been doing lately with Ruby, if or if you've been doing something lately with Ruby that you've enjoyed. Okay. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm new, although not as new as I was last time. Um, I'm just learning Ruby. I'm taking the study group class here on Saturdays and trying to get familiar with Ruby and Rails. It's wonderful. Um, Rob Biedenhardt, I'm um, doing Ruby almost exclusively for about uh, seven or eight years now. Uh, so, um, independent developer, do a lot of Rails projects. Okay. I'm Josh, um, just started studying Ruby recently, so I don't know too much yet. But cool. Got to turn a lot of years. Nice. I'm Shannon, I came, I've come to two Ruby meetups, so I'm an ex expert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> True. And Shannon's company tonight sponsored the pizza, so thank Shannon for the pizza. So, thank you, Resolve It. Uh, Matt Brewer, I work for Engage Partners, currently Kroger, I Ruby on and off for like, gosh, I don't know, uh, three years, but never professionally. Uh, I come here because I don't want to get too far away. <laughs> it's okay. We'll never let go, Matt. <laughs> I'm Jason. I have been doing Ruby for, well, I guess about 12 years now, off and on. Um, hasn't been an everyday thing, but hoping to make it an everyday thing. I'm entering the job market, so if I know anybody here's about opportunities for doing some Ruby stuff, I'd be interested to know about it. Cool. That's cool, right? I'm bringing my mic up. <laughs> I love your sticker on your laptop. Oh, that is awesome. Thank you. Um, it's just from Etsy. I wish I could say I did. Oh, this. man. <laughs> you can uh, You can just send them a picture. Find, they did, they did a, there was a guy on Etsy who already had a Cincinnati one ready to go. Really? Yeah. That is awesome. Cool. Yeah. I'm not seeing My name is Alex. I don't have any cool stickers on my laptop. That's <laughs> fine. Um, I guess I live more around the Dayton area. I just happen to be down here for the day. Cool. I thought I stopped by. Don't really know much Ruby. Um, more experience with uh, PHP, um, but I'm getting more interested in web applications. So, of course, Ruby and Rails. Yeah. Um, so. Cool. Glad to have you. <clears throat> the glitch. Yes, I've been doing Ruby for about eight years off and on, um, but mostly off, more off and on probably. So. Um, Joe Herbers, uh, Java consultant, dabbled in Ruby for a couple of years, but you say you're so many consultant. Java. That's true. It equals. Job equals. I can attest to his yeah. gentlemanhood. <laughs> Ryan, introduce Hi. yourself. Oh, hi, I'm Ryan. <laughs> uh, design mostly. Cool. 
Do anything fun with Ruby lately? Uh, no, I'm back in PHP most of this week. Uh -huh. This <laughs> <laughs> yeah, A week's not too bad. Interesting. Cool. Joe, we've been doing um, Rails and Ruby development as a platform of choice for five or six years. I don't know, off and on before that. Uh, primarily now I'm doing infrastructure and architecture quite extensive scope, so don't get to do a lot of code. Mm. I, I work with like a sidekick for everything. Oh, nice. Yeah, I love sidekick. Nice. I may, I may need to talk to you about that. I might have That's a. Pretty awesome. Yeah. I'm uh, RJ. I'm new to programming. I've been messing around with Ruby and stuff for about four, five months now. Cool. Nice. Cool. Thanks for coming. Could be worse, could be assets precompile. I'm Nathan Sharp. I've been doing Ruby and Rails for about nine months now in web development for uh, since the beginning of last year and was an attorney before that. And um, yeah, I work at Clifton Labs as of really recently. So cool. my first actual full time job. Congrats. Nice. Congratulations, yeah. Jim Anders, uh, former Flash developer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> let's make a comeback. <laughs> no, no, no. You can develop Flash. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> thanks to Gaslight, I turned to Ruby and Rails about three years ago and kind of looked back then. Nice. Now Take I'm that. a huge AngularJS proponent. Trying to push that onto everyone so that yeah. I can. So there will, there will be an Angular meetup, I believe, on the 30th? 30th yeah. yeah, here at Gaslight uh, during the day at noon. Is so. that, is that true? One more time. Yep. An Angular JS meetup here at Gaslight, uh, July 30th at noon. Mike Ball is organizing that. Um, going out on the, uh, on the Google Plus, actually. If you go to Google Plus Communities and search for Sensi with a Y N G, um, there's a Google Plus group. So. That's uh, in August, you said, or just July, July thirtieth. So. Almost. So. There you go. Um, so last month, um, how many people were here last month? Raise your hand. Okay, I see a few people who weren't. So cool. Um, so last month we did a kind of Ruby Kata exercise uh, called Ruby Warrior. Um, it's a kind of fun little um, programming exercise where you play this little AI warrior uh, who has to make his way through a dungeon and uh, there are obstacles and you start it starts out really simply um, and it is I, sh I should actually mention what it is it's a Ruby gem um, that you install Gem install Ruby Warrior. And you start out in a little square dungeon. Um, I probably should have had a beginner ready. Um, let's see. Actually, I can start on this one and it should play from the beginning. You can like run with the level if you wanted to. Yeah, that's true. Warrior L1. L1, yeah. So you start on a really simple level here where you just have to walk to the end. And you do that by programming um, a class called player. Okay. 
Uh, good? Oh, in the terminal. I'm sorry. Yeah, you should do that, huh? So, I ran this Ruby Warrior command, and you can see this is my guy. This is my Ruby Warrior. This is high definition graphics here. Um, and these are stairs, and this is a dungeon, and I have to get to the stairs to get to the next level. So, uh, the way you do that is by walking your guy forward. And how you do that is you have a class here called player. And inside of that, you have a method definition of uh, play turn. And uh, you can manipulate your warrior in here. And one of the one things you can do is tell your warrior to walk. And that will have him walk forward. So first level, pretty simple. You just say warrior walk. And each turn it will run that play turn method, right? So your warrior walks to the end of the stairs and you're done with the level. Success, you found the stairs. You get some, you're scored on time, um, for, uh, score for clearing, um, and s certain other things that can define your score. But anyway, you progress kind of building this Ruby class and this AI to get through more difficult dungeons as you go. So we did this last month. It was a lot of fun. At least I, I had a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it was kind of challenging. I didn't finish. A few people did. Um, and one of the things we were talking about doing this month is take some of the solutions, uh, whether you finish or not, anybody who wants to show those off, and talk about them. Uh, maybe we could discuss those. And then um, Doug actually came up with this really great pattern for how to solve Ruby Warrior. Um, so that's not quite characterized well. There okay. is a pattern that I recognize applies well. To what yes. I'm doing. <laughs> I'm trying to give you all the credit here, man. That's okay. All right. So. Um, so did anybody want to show off your solution uh, that was here last month? I know Jeff said. I'd be happy to. All right, cool. All right, hop up there, Jeff. Hop up, Jeff. This is the only thing that's interesting in the whole thing. Um, oh, look at you. Did I steal your thunder, Doug? Uh, very largely. Okay. <laughs> I, I was worried about that, which is why I didn't speak up until James pointed at me. Uh, okay. um, so the approach that I took was to implement a command pattern. <laughs> no, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. Um, the, the basic idea was that you've got a number of different things here that you might want to so do. Let's actually, there's a 10-minute video that I would, that introduces the command. All right, let's do that. Okay. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show the command pattern, and then I would like to look at your code. It's All right. Do it on here. Do you want me to just do it on here? Or do you want to? I think Kevin's going to be sad because he can't project your screen. Okay, I'll turn up here. Oh, All right. Am I broadcasting already? No, I mean, I've got this desktop presenter running over here. So this video was presented as a, um, <clears throat> one of the developers was saying that the presence of if, else if, case statements, that kind of switching logic is a smell in your code. And sometimes we can't avoid it, but sometimes we can. And so he takes this, um, he takes this code, which has this block in here, and I'll, I'll zoom this out here in just a minute, that has this 
if, else if, else if, else if, end. And he refactors this. And I found this because I was um, on, uh, on Twitter. It was tweeted out, and the guy was saying, oh, he took this code, which was seven lines, and he turns it into about 35 lines of code. And it doesn't seem like it's a good trade-off that this pattern causes the size of your code to balloon. But it really encapsulates what we were doing very well. And when James and I did, we, last night we pair programmed on doing this command pattern on Ruby Warrior, and the solution was very different than what I did the other night with Shannon, and I forget the other guy's name who was there with us. And it, it forces you to go in a direction that I think is a better design. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start this video here. And I'm going to bump us up to 1080p and full screen. And okay, let me start over. Is that all the way up? I hate if statements. I hate if statements, else if statements, and case statements. And if there's any way possible that I can get rid of them in my code, I look for. If I try to write him, if I, if I write an if statement within my code, I contemplate whether I've made a bad design decision. This is an extreme stance and something that doesn't apply at every single moment while I'm doing my software development. But it does apply it in the moment of, say, for the microblogger tutorial that we have on Start Lab. And over time, imagining that the microblogger application could grow and grow, this, this place, this process command method, would continue to grow and become an eyesore within your application. One way we might refactor this statement is to create several methods for some of this functionality. Oftentimes, if this were to match several different statements, the input were to consider not just the first letter being quit or the last letter being quit, maybe the first or second word being quit, we might consider creating a new method. So in this case, quit command match, given the input, might be where we offload the rest of this work. For now, we'll leave this as input equals quit, or Q, and then we'll determine whether that value is true or not. And in the same way, what we execute eventually could be larger and more complicated. So it might be easier to do is just specify a method, quit command execute. And define within that method the code that we need to execute. We can continue to refactor the remaining pieces uh, in a very simple way. But it's important to take note again of a pattern here that was emerging, is that the quit command what matches also has a quit command execute. These two statements really represent one piece of logic within the system. And so it's important that perhaps we can use uh, classes to represent that information. So what I'd like to define is a quit command. And inside that quit command, we define whether it matches and whether it executes. And here now, instead of what we defined before, we say quit equals the command not new. And now we match on this. We said quit command underscore match. And whether it matches, and then we execute the code if it does match. We can continue to build the rest of these commands as we've done for the quit command in the same way. Okay. And notice here now is actually what's happening is that it becomes clear what's taking place. We have an object in which the match is taking place, and then if it does match, we execute on the thing. And if we have a match here on tweet, then we execute on the tweet. And really what we're doing is we're finding, we're iterating or moving through an entire list of each of these commands, and then finding the one that matches, and then executing them. And so it might make more sense if we actually sort of combine these commands into an array, and then use Ruby's find method to find the match, the matching command. Now with that found command, we simply need to write execute. And now before we remove this code, we suddenly introduce a new bug. One that didn't exist before in the previous code. Previously, if a command didn't match, essentially no code was executed. 
And the problem now that we've introduced into our system is that when no command matches, a nil is returned, and what would happen is nil is being called execute. That's a problem. And essentially what we need to do is create a command that always matches, a command that would always take place, but essentially no action would, would be executed. Now the no action command is not really remarkable as far as its structure or layout and functionality, but it's important to show here. So I'm going to take a moment to write that out. When the no action command, whether it matches, it's always true. That way, there is nothing that slips by the no action command. It's just important that the no action command be the last command in the list. Otherwise, it will clobber other actions. So now what we have is a list of valid commands that will iterate through each one, and it will find the one that matches. If none match, then the last one will, of course, match, and then, of course, execute. So now, I think, successfully, we can delete this code. Now, this is great as far as functionality goes, because in the future, we can add more commands if we want. So we can define something as a small refactoring, is moving these into here, into a new function. So if we had our commands, we can move them into its own commands function. Might be a start. And then we might also just write command point. Give it the input. And essentially, give this to the Given our command input, we might now execute it. And no longer is our process command an ISIL within an application. And in the future, perhaps our commands itself would become an ISIL. But we can address that later. All right, there you go. <coughs> That's obviously applies to what we're doing as well, and maybe if you wanted to come. Sure, I'll come. I didn't do it quite exactly the same, so this is sort of a variant. As an aside, the, the no action command is also sometimes called a pattern. That's also, it's called the, uh, the null object pattern. And so it's the idea of um, coming up with an instance of an object that just stands in place of null, right? Takes a default action or no action or whatever the case may be. Um, and prevents you from having to do null checks and things like that. So I actually um, took a fairly similar route. And I, I mean, the reason that I sort of was doing this was just because it became fairly legible to sort of say, here are the kinds of things that I want to do. Sure. Maybe. Yeah? Better? So that was sort of the uh, the the tack that I took. Um, if you see the exact same sort of thing that he was doing there with the find with the action, um, I, I sort of simplified this in some ways though, is and just returned lambdas. And lambdas are essentially just um, uh, I'm not going to even explain lambdas well, but it's essentially a, a a function call, right? And so the call on that is just executing that, that higher order function that gets returned from these methods that are defined like this. Um, the, so I didn't really just get rid of ifs. I encapsulated the idea of should I do this action and what action should I take into each of those lambdas. Um, so this is kind of awesome and it doesn't pass the last, last level. So, I mean, just take that for what it's worth. <laughs> Uh, this is really great, except it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so the pattern that I settled on, and, and this is probably, there's probably a better way to do this, but basically to, to check a conditional um, like this, and then to do an action, and if I execute that action, then I return true, and otherwise I return false, right? And the return true in the, that action causes the find to stop executing at that point. So essentially what this is doing is it's check if I should do this, check if I should do that, check if I should do that, check if I should do that. Oh yes, I should do that, execute that action, return true. It short circuits the rest, right? And so uh, the sort of the next thing that I did was come up with a whole bunch of predicates and the predicates were just sort of these true statements about, uh, you know, about the world around me. Right, and so the combination of the lambdas, lambdas and the predicates, ultimately I could have also encapsulated, I think, the, the actions themselves into their own little methods. Um, but do I have low health? 
can I make a rang ranged attack? Should I run away? Um, am I next to an enemy? These various things, uh, to me, are very legible, right? So the idea is I should be able to read that and understand what it does without looking at the details of, oh my god, I'm doing weird things with indexes of directions and stuff like that. Now, ultimately, this is just trying to find, do I see enemies in my viewpoint, right? So whether or not you understand that code, at least you can hopefully understand the intent. I um, wrote that a month ago, and I'm not even 100% sure I understand it anymore. So, um, that's not good. <laughs> but, yeah, so anyway, I, like I said, so, uh, you know, if I want to rest if I'm injured, so I check my health. I also check a few things, like am I taking damage and am I next to an enemy, because if I'm standing next to an enemy or I'm taking damage, resting right now would probably be a bad idea. Um, and if, I, if so, I rest, I return true. Otherwise, I return false. And like, you, like, like I was saying, the disadvantage of this is you see this sort of boilerplate like that I've got everywhere, which is return true or otherwise return false. Um, not quite as slick as actually going sort of the object route of, um, you know, should I do it versus execute it. But I was just trying to be... A little more functional. I was trying to be a little bit more functional and a little bit slicker with sort of lambdas and whatnot of returning higher order functions from methods so that they were named. So yeah, my question, script, of, right? my question about this is is why why have functions that return the lambdas instead of just having functions? What's the value of having those that return the lambda that you call versus just calling those in order? Uh, because calling them in order, as far as I know, um, this is about the execution, when something gets executed, right? So if you define a function, call it right here, it's actually executed in the context of creating this array. You could pass in a symbol. Right, I could, I could. The symbol name. Yeah, I could pass in a symbol and then yeah, absolutely. There are other ways to do it. But if you just did rest if injured yeah. and, you know, foo, right, what you'd get is true, false, false, false as, a, you know, yeah. as an array. Yeah. So, yeah, so what you're saying is I would have to do something like this, and then I would have to do something like, what's the? Send. Try or send or, yeah, okay. Send. With a call? No call. No, no. Call. Yeah. So, right. That would be absolutely another way to do it. All right. Um, so one value in not just calling the methods, though, is that you can short circuit this uh, before you get down the chain, right? Like, if you rest if injured, then you don't need any logic and kill enemies to, to say whether you rested or not. What, what Doug just suggested would have the exact same behavior. Um, one of the subtleties of uh, the difference between lambdas and procs that I, uh, exists in Ruby as well is sort of where things are executed. I could have potentially done this as procs, I think. I'm going to probably get this wrong. Rob, correct me. Um, essentially, the, the return point of a, of a lambda, uh, it always sort of causes... I'm not going to, never mind, take, I'm taking back everything I was just going to say because I don't even understand if, it. If you did it the way that I suggested of having symbols and calling send on the action, then the return from the function would be returning from the function and not from your find. It wouldn't short circuit. No, I still think it would. I, I wouldn't, I couldn't, re I'd have to take out the return of the lambda, of course, and just have the function execution. Um, but essentially at that point, you know, you're still just calling the function uh, and, and you're evaluating it at the time that find mm. is called, right? So you just can't... So the first one that returns true... True, would still have the yeah, same impact on the find. execute things to figure out what's true. Right, right. I mean, the, the right. my way is definitely not quite as clean, like I was saying, because I had that boilerplate return true, return false, and I, I didn't ever figure out a way to sort of make that like a sort of simpler kind of construct. You know, you could think about... Again, this sort of boiled down to, other than a couple of places, this boiled down to, you know, check some predicate, execute some action. I mean, that's still yep. sort of what it is. So mine gets all the way through to the last level and then doesn't quite know what, how to handle it. What the, happens at the last level? Uh, it doesn't quite know how to handle the difference. Um, 
Uh, sorry, let me make this bigger. I think it gets confused at this point around uh, it's too far away to shoot a the wizard or something like that. It walks in it, so it's, it knows it sees a wizard, but it's out of range of its bow or something along those lines, and so it just stands there and shoots, mm. and nobody hits anybody. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, so see, I shoot and I hit nothing, I shoot and I hit nothing, and eventually I was like, well, I should probably stop this. <laughs> Nice. So, yeah. How long would it go on if you didn't stop it? Forever. Until your laptop decayed. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't have like a timer to quit after. As far as I know, it would last forever. But I, I think it actually will last after so many iterations. Okay. Well, absolutely. This has a lot of the same advantages to the command pattern in that if you want to have an extra action, you can just decide where in this scale it lives. And essentially, it's this is the priority order. Yeah. Right? At the highest level, it's, man, if I'm hurt, I need to rest. You know, it, otherwise, I need to move to avoid being hurt. Otherwise, I need to turn around and face people. Otherwise, kill stuff. Right? And the very last thing I do is walk. So, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, somewhere in here, like, in between here... If I could figure out I was out of range, I should be like, you know, walk forward and attack or something like that. Yeah. But I think, you know, again, with us reusing the predicates, um, you know, you've, there's a lot of them down here. I would just have to probably add one more about sort of de determining something about distance or being in range to a, uh, my bow or whatever it is. So I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to avoid... You know, well, it, it, it came up mostly in the in the video, but you know that the no uh, whatever the, the no op the no op command, like you have to re guarantee that it's the last thing in the list. Yes. And that that be kind of that kind of makes me uncomfortable. You know, <laughs> like how do I guarantee going forward that it'll stay be always the last thing? So you know, I don't know. Yeah. But the, and with the game, with the game, it's different. I mean, I think you know, because of the game. You you have to do things in order anyway, so I, you know, but I, just thinking about that generically, you know, it's, you know, it makes me... Yeah, see, th this is my, th this is my default action, right, that returns, so, I mean, I, I don't actually technically have to return anything, I execute yeah. this and it's done with the find, it doesn't yeah. care. Um, I mean, I think this is all about encapsulation, right? You have to have the place yeah. that uses that list sort of have encapsulated the construction of that list. Yeah. You can't arbitrarily allow people to add stuff into your collection unless you have, you know, explicitly sort of wrap that so that you know that your no op always stays at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one yeah. way around that is don't put the no op in the list. Put yeah. the no op as an alternative and find return nil. Say this right. list right. not find something or no op right. Right. execute. Yeah, that's, yeah that's actually a really good idea. Right. So you do. I mean, I, this is what you were just saying. If you were in that commands, or it was the, what was it, find command? Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, you know, you do the command dot find, you do your input, um, you know, whatever. Stuff. Stuff, match, or no op, right? Yeah. 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 And then, yeah, then, exactly, then the horn, that was a good, that's a good idea. No, th that that's just junk. That's just junk. Okay. It was just an example. But you could go up there and change your walk. Have your walk be your default action on your. My walk is way. my walk is my default. But I mean, to, oh, oh, to make sure right. that that always happens. Right. So I didn't. Of this stuff. I did mine in line, like he sort of right. started with. But you could change. Your but I could extract that into say you know perform an action or something. Right. Like. I didn't consider that a risk because I didn't consider like you know a lot of other people coming in and mucking with this. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, it seems, since it's a game, you know, you have to do like there's no order of operations in a game. I mean, you know, they, you know so you know, I think it's a little, I think it's easier to avoid. <laughs> that could be true like in this application uh, specifically. You know, it's already extracted the play turn. Yeah, like an ordered queue would have the same. But it almost seems like if this were to get any more complicated, 
logic wise, like say they they introduced a, a character that would like walk in at you from the other side or something like that. So actually, Which the intermediate the level gets yeah. a lot more complicated. Yeah, I was oh, okay. Say, so it almost about layer and it seems like it seems like we're almost going to need a new structure to represent uh, these decisions. Oh, 100 percent. You know, yeah. because you know, e even though what you're what you're doing here has cleaned it up a lot, behind the scenes it's still like you know, if statements plugged into each other all over the place and you're looking at those different predicates and, you know, yeah. I'm assuming your rest if injured also checks to see if you're getting hit by a ranged attack. It, absolutely, time. yeah, it so did, it did. This is actually good for me because my implementation is quite different than this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, oh, yeah. I think, Doug, you should go after Well, unless somebody else wants to show something else as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, to your point, yeah, the predicates and stuff like that immediately become something you could extract into sort of a wrapper kind of helper class or something like that, but... Yeah, I'll, I won't say anything else about this other than it will fall down relatively quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as you guys started walking through the levels, I, I missed last month, but you know, it's pretty easy to start with just a, you know an if statement here and a statement there. Yeah. How how far did you get before you decided? Oh, this is too many if statements. That's so you know. last month we got all the way through before I decided. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but ago. but when James and I paired, we yeah. decided. Like basically the second level, we yeah. were doing this on purpose, and yeah. so we second or third level was when yeah. last month I, I hit it and I, I had to actually start. Yeah, I think I I think I was on the second level, maybe the third level, where I was like, this is going to get unwieldy, and I sort of recognized what I was doing. Yeah, that so was not that smart. Well, good for you, Jim. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> I I also had this, you know, I've I've been doing too much functional programming uh, recently, and I sort of had this. This was more of a theory. That I should like, you know what? I'm going to do this with lambdas, <laughs> you know. So. But that's one of the purpose of the kata, right? You're supposed to yeah. practice this more, and then you'll see the pattern more quickly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so I mean, this this has some. It's some. There's some cool stuff, and there's some serious like weaknesses in it. You know, this this thing I think is just a serious weakness. But. So I did this um, originally, James and I did this, and we put it all in one file, uh, much like the refactoring that he showed where he just built classes in line and all that kind of stuff. I got frustrated because um, it was hard to navigate that file eventually, and so I went home and I broke this apart uh, into multiple files. And knowing that I was going to show this tonight, um, I maybe did this a little bit more complicated than what I would have done it on my own. Um, I, I just couldn't let it sit. <laughs> um, so let's just, I'm going to bring up Sublime Text. That's what I'm supposed to be using these days, right? How do I make this go away so that it's only I one thing? Command, command option one. It just like killed it. Oh, there we are. Okay, here's my player. My player is really small. He includes all these actions, which uses the command pattern, and then he uses what James and I named the mindful warrior. 
that one of the one of the the downsides of the warrior that we're given is he has no concept of state he only knows the now and so we created this mindful warrior to encapsulate the warrior in his previous state um, and so the turn here we cre we we have a mindful warrior which is memoized so he's so that's how he keeps his state the first time through he's created subsequent turns he uses the same warrior the same mindful warrior and so we get a new warrior passed into us each turn and so we're just updating our mindful warrior with the current copy of the warrior as he goes through i did not pull this out into like a command for input i left this right in line where um, I take the actions passing in my warrior and I call find with a dot match so the action actually I was supposed to rename that um, James told me to rename that and I didn't do it and then whichever one I find I execute and then the last thing I do is I just store off the health and that's all that has to happen in the play in the in the warrior and in the play term so if we go look at these actions um, this is pretty uh pretty bare uh we have a, a base action which has a warrior and we just save the warrior off as it's passed in we have this method which has here's my list of all my commands which are classes and i instantiate those new classes passing in the warrior um, and return this list of commands and it, and this is order dependent just like the example in the video was and just like what Jeff showed and I explicitly put my no action here in the end um, and then here's my no action that's in line here I didn't create a separate file for him because I didn't really care about him but then I have a separate file for each of the actions that are being performed so the order here is rest pivot shoot back up rescue so I'll show you the rest this is actually um, kind of this is one of the more complicated ones but what this means is basically in Jeff's example let me that why doesn't command shift plus work command plus there we go so in Jeff's example he had one method that included the predicate and the execution in this case the execution almost turns into each of these actions that are in the action file turns into each of the commands that the warrior uh, class gives us we have a rest we have a shoot we have a walk we have an attack we have a you know all these commands they turn into an action and the execute almost in every case is just do the thing so this becomes a question of should we do that thing and this is really just a series of of, of boolean tests uh, so this one has to exit early uh, because the resting is a little bit more complicated to decide when to rest. But this question of um, should I be backing up or not, we kind of made the decision that right off the bat we want to back up to the back wall uh, and figure out where the back wall was and then go forward from there. So that's the question. You know, if we, Have we found the back wall? Is there an archer? Should we back up if we find the archer? And then the command is just simply to walk backwards. The explorer is similar to the walk. He checks to see if the square is empty and then he walks. Uh, the pivot, if we get to the far wall at level seven, I think you start off facing the wall and the first thing you have to do is turn around. So if we feel the wall, then we turn around. Uh, each of these things are really simple and it becomes really clear here's the test should I do this thing and how should I do it um, rescuing the captive uh, attacking or shooting this was like the last one if we sense a war if we sense an enemy backwards if we sense an enemy forwards um, then we're gonna shoot him so then this brings down to the mindful warrior which is similar to Jeff's predicates that um, he has things like, hey, am I, am I dangerously damaged? What's my max health? Have I sensed an archer? Am I sensing an enemy? Have I sensed a wall? Um, and then the rest of everything else is just passed off to the, to the warrior himself. Uh, so he just delegates everything to the warrior except for these added states that's on here. And then, like I said, this guy here is pretty tight and small. And he actually wins <laughs> but he doesn't get the maximum score small bonus. a small bonus
<laughs> so if we do like um, Ruby Warrior dash L nine. So here's the last level. And so what he does, what he's doing is he's standing in the middle. He sees enemies. He's just standing there and he's shooting both enemies. And he'll kill both enemies and then he'll go rescue the captive. And then he leaves. And this other wizard and this other captive, he never saw this wizard, this other captive. And he just said, hey, I'm out of here. It's all good. That's probably actually a better strategy because I tried to kill that wizard and it just went all the time. So I actually, I actually got a C is the grade that I got on this. But it's really weird because the grades are S, A, B, C, D, E, F. So S is perfect, A is pretty good, and then C is not so awesome, so you but still passing. The, the time bonus did you t did you rest when you should when you didn't need to, and then you get you know points for not rescuing the captive or not killing all not clearing the room. So yeah, he runs the whole, um, the epic mode. But anyway, I thought that, I saw that video and I thought, wow, this is exactly like um, yeah. I'm Ruby Warrior. Wrote, wrote it was on the other guy's machine. I don't have it. The play turn was clearly if, and, but we did name those methods, those predicate methods, if this is true, and then we named the methods for, this, for whatever the actions were, but they were written more literally. So we had this whole list of one-off predicates and this whole list of one-off executions, and it was just, hey, if this predicate is true, then execute this, else if this predicate is true, execute that. And it did become quite unwieldy. And you start trying to combine logic on there. Oh, well, here I've got these predicates. If I combine it, maybe this will solve the problem. Or I'll move this one up here and, you know, try re resting before I shoot, that kind of thing. Or worse, you have to check the same, some of the same predicates on down because you're not certain they were checked above, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was the difference in using the command pattern because each of these predicates are completely isolated. You have to think differently about how you're doing it. You can't say, oh, I know that this one is going to be all right because I've already run these other up here. Their, their order is independent of each other, right? Now, it matters in order to, score, to win the game, but these predicates can be run at any time, and they don't depend on which order these predicates have been run. Had, and you loaded the array the way you did it, if you go back to that. Yeah, so how'd you decide how to... Because if you would have pivoted, like, first, maybe you would have saw the other wizard and... So the way that we did it is we built this up one level at a time. Yeah. Oh, and really? so each level said, oh, you have to do something else. And so we would stick a new action in there, and we would put the action in the right spot. And as it turns out, we were right the whole way through. And it, we never had a situation where we were confused because it's like, oh, this is easy. All we have to do is turn around. So you put in the pivot action and this, solve the system, right? In fact, I feel like we skipped a few levels without having to actually change our pivot. Oh, really? Pretty fast right away. And then we named it to rescue one captive. Yes. <laughs> 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 Rescue nearby captive. <laughs> anyway, so the the intermediate level, the thing about this beginner level is all the rooms are are exactly the same size. All you have to do is go left or right. In the intermediate level, all the rooms are square. And you have things that are in all directions around you. And the, and the, the stairs are not at the same place every time. And so your exploration logic has to be a lot smarter. I've not played the intermediate level. Um, it looks really kind of fantastic. And um, I would be very interested. I don't know. How, I mean, it's 730. I don't know how much longer we're going to stay here tonight. Yeah. But it would be fun to pair off and work on the intermediate level.
So this code is actually um, on the GitHub's. If you wanted to, if you wanted to use this code, you're welcome to. It's a public repo on Gaslight Ruby Warrior. Uh, I don't know that it's going to be very useful at all, other than it's just an implementation of the yeah. pattern. Yeah, and I, it, I can tell you, it, it does not pass the first intermediate level. It, it give <laughs> it all it does is give you the action array, requiring the files from the directory correctly, and it has maybe you know just the infrastructure. I'm pretty sure almost yeah. all of it's going to have to be changed. There's some neat code too. If you're new to Ruby and you don't know what things like method missing are and a few other things, it might be good to check out. It's a way to do it. Yeah. yeah. You might want to show people how to get it, get the gem installed and get it set up. Since there's people who haven't done it. Yeah, we did that last week, as or last month as well. Um, if whoever's machine's not set up, we could certainly do that again. So we could do intermediate level next month um, if you know, people can't stay. Did anybody else have a solution that they'd want to show off? I know, Jim, you finished. Yeah, but Come on, Jim. I kind of let uh, Michael do it since he was. Yeah. We so can show I have Michael's the code, solution and then you can blame but him. Take care. Yeah. I can show it all. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. Really this. Man, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I told him not to do this, but he did it anyway. I sprained my MCL, of all things, again for the second time in my life. I, I honestly think that it was more of a hyperextension than anything. Running hills. <laughs> Welcome to what I deal with all day. Wait, you hired me? I didn't. I only have to put up with him for three more weeks, so it's it's yeah. good. So I didn't have much say in all of this, um, as Michael is very new to Ruby. I kind of let him drive, and was there for moral support. So it looks like we're storing direction. Opposite direction, health, number of walls hit, calling a feel. And I noticed that he must have done this after the fact, but he pulled a lot of this stuff out into different methods. It's sort of a similar, I mean, a lot Look, of. He's, he's storing the warrior health plus two on the rest command. And do his health variable. Interesting. It did. Yeah. And I think it actually got a pretty good overriding overriding the health or the health isn't actually stored on the class. Was it dash L nine is the last level? What? Not in epic mode. Faster. Right, and then it, it throws a, a method missing because... Uh, I'm, yeah. So wait a minute, we gave you guys a shirt for finishing first and it doesn't even run. Oh. We actually didn't because we ran out of shirt sizes. He ran this on his laptop. Right. <laughs> works for me. <laughs> I have some standard code that I actually wrote if you want me to show it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what there is to say about it. <laughs> I didn't write it. I don't know what there is to say about mine either, but I wrote it. So. Well, I mean, I think, you, I think you can kind of see a little bit, you know, yeah. just sort of the difference. Um, you know, it's got much more of that sort of... Uh, if else this, if do else this, that. To be fair, it's only, yeah. what, like 60-something lines, right? Right. It's not Break if. Crazy. It's very... Did you say yours is 700? 70. Oh, 70. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> that's 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 <laughs> <laughs> you use all the batteries. I'm going to step through each line real carefully with you guys. 600 lines. 620 of those are 
But yeah, I mean, this could be extracted out. I mean, there's look, rest, walk, yeah. walk, rescue, walk, it looks attack. Like you started to do that. You just didn't finish. I'll see if I can get it running again. That'll be my task for the afternoon, evening. I'm curious if anybody tried the goals and beliefs kind of approach that James talked about. So Karen kind of did. I don't know how far she got. Um, I wanted to. Uh, my code kind of had some of that, which was going, now that I see the command pattern, was starting to hit that direction, was I had a way of tracking More instead of uh, asking questions, more like uh, I believe this, you know, and then if it returns true, and then the goal would kind of be your execute. So the command pattern's kind of similar, really. Uh, but Jeff, you were uh, you were saying that um, the without without being like completely functional, the goal and belief thing is a little difficult. Well, no, I mean I think. Right, it is very similar to a command pattern. It's just, it's sort of, um, in general, it's the, I think the pattern uses higher order functions so that you've sort of got um, sort of the combination of higher order functions that sort of achieve the command pattern. So essentially, like, you would have a belief of I'm getting damaged, right? And you'd have a belief of I want to not be damaged, right? And then you'd have a goal of, like, you know, moving away from being damaged or killing things or whatever. Um, and it, it's, it's very similar in the command pattern kind of in is the, the end in that it's just sort of a way to think about sort of structuring the program. Does that approach break you out of the dependency on the order in which you test the different commands? Um, I'm not 100% sure that it does. Um, I mean... Well, I guess you could well, test beliefs first and then apply a goal and match hierarchy of beliefs. Yeah. Because if one of your beliefs is attack and another one of your beliefs is don't die. Goals. A hierarchy goals. of goals. One of your right. goals. Yeah, so I mean that's that's the fundamental part is you have to sort of really structure it in the in the right way, right? So the um, I think the, the beliefs are about the environment around you and what you wanna and the goals are about what you want to accomplish, right? So um, not getting injured is a goal, but killing things is a goal and rescuing captives is a goal and finding the stairs are okay. they're all goals. Um, the application of the beliefs is, is the That's all the predicates basically. It, it is and, and yeah, but I think we might be oversimplifying it a little bit. Yeah. I we need Karen to really explain it. Yeah. We need Karen. We need Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was working. So the other thing that I'll mention failed level four <laughs> is speaking of <laughs> speaking of Karen. Um, in I think September, maybe. Yeah. Yes. She's. Uh, organizing a uh, a node copter event. There's a web page for it. You could probably pull it up. That is um, uh, an open event, or it may cost to register. It's not clear to me yet. But um, it's a open hacking event on playing with uh, AR drones and programming drones. And uh, they're going to have a bunch of the drones there, uh, as their plan is to have enough drones for um, everyone to be in a small team hacking on one of the drones. It's going to be at um, Top Gun facility. And um, she's looking for sponsors to make sure that there's enough drones there. And the thing, cool thing is, is after the event, you can keep the drone. <laughs> so you sponsor the event, and you supply it. Either you get her money, and she buys the drone, or you buy your own drone and bring it. Um, and then teams form up and do things with them, and then if they go. survive. <laughs> if they survive, you get it back. Yeah. Well, you get it back regardless. It's just yeah. <laughs> whether you get it back in one piece or many. 
So I love the, the schedule. You register, and there's an intro, and then you hack, and then there's lunch, and then there's more hacking, and then you wrap it up. <laughs> Any questions? It's pretty straightforward. <coughs> Tickets are coming soon. So, yeah, 450. It's the drone, the spare parts, and it helps go towards the cost of lunch. And since Karen is working on facial recognition of her drone, being a drone friend might be a good benefit. Yes, <laughs> be a drone friend now. Yes. <laughs> While you still can. Oh, she changed that. Cool. Yep. Come up, hang out with us on a Saturday. Program some drones. It'll be cool. Does anyone else read that as? No decopter. No decopter. Yeah. I do now. Yeah. So I thought maybe I'd be really friendly with that drone, but now I feel like he's disappointed. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I feel like we have to use no JS now. Cool. I saw something about NPM on there, so. Yeah. Yeah. And modulus. Yeah. You don't. You don't have to. I mean, the the one code chain. Mm. It's the node library, but you can also, there are some, the Ruby, there's a Ruby library. So it's using AR. Yeah. So it is, does enclosure, right? Is it, CLJ drone is her library, yeah, it's I her think. Library. Mm -hmm. And Argus is Jim's Ruby library. JavaScript, all the things. How's it working out? Yeah, really. Cool. All right. So I guess we're not doing the intermediate this month. Yeah. So at seven thirty-eight.